Welcome to the first video in the ROS series. In these videos, we'll be diving into the robot operating system to show you how you can use it in your RoboJackets projects. So what is ROS? Despite its name, it's not an operating system in the same way as Windows or Linux. It's actually a software framework. It's a collection of tools, libraries, and standards that are all focused on collaborative robotics development. It's all geared towards making it easier to build robots as a team. And it's been very successful at that. Many of the top universities and companies are using ROS as the foundation of their robotics projects. In these videos, we'll be covering the second generation of ROS, appropriately called ROS2. If you're familiar with ROS1, many of the core concepts are the same. The big differences are in the underlying technologies and programming interfaces. As you're learning and working with ROS, there are a number of online resources that will be helpful. First up, ROS.org is the main website with general information about the ROS project. For documentation about core ROS concepts and tools, check out docs.ros.org and select the version that you're using. At answers.ros.org, you'll find a Stack Exchange style question and answers site. You can post questions and get answers from other ROS users or even from the ROS developers. Finally, when you're looking for documentation for a specific package, go to index.ros.org. There you can look up a package by name and see version-specific documentation and source code links. With that, we're ready to really start talking about ROS, and the first concept we need to cover is the ROS graph. ROS takes these big, complicated robotics projects and breaks them into smaller, purpose-driven pieces. Instead of having one big program that handles all the behavior for a robot, we have many smaller programs, each of which only handles a piece of the problem. In ROS, we call each of these programs a node, and an individual robot will take many nodes to actually get it up and running. Each node has a single purpose. We might have a node that pulls images off a camera, and that will be separate from the node that processes those images in some way. And that will be separate from the node that actually lets us view those images in a window. Each of these nodes is an individual program running on our machine, and they're working together to get a larger task done. The real power behind this approach is that we can swap out different implementations for each of these nodes without having to recompile the whole codebase, and without the other nodes really noticing the change. We could, for example, swap out this camera node for one that connects to a different kind of camera, and use the same processing and display nodes without having to change their code. Each node is independent of the others. We're able to keep these nodes separate by clearly defining the connections that each node supports. Then, any two nodes that support the same kind of connections can be hooked up to each other at runtime. There are three types of connections found in ROS. Topics, services, and actions. Topics let us send one-way information between nodes. This is the simplest and most common type of connection in ROS. Some topics might just connect two nodes together, and other topics might connect many nodes to the same data source. Topics are useful for tasks like streaming sensor data or motion commands. Services allow a client node to send a request to a server node, have that server node do some calculation, then send a response back to the client. Services are useful when data needs to be queried, or when a node wants to provide an interface for running some calculation, such as planning a path. Actions are similar to services, but allow for asynchronous, long-running tasks. The client sends a goal to the server, the server starts working towards that goal and periodically sends feedback back to the client, and finally, the server sends a response to the client, letting it know whether or not it was able to accomplish the goal. Actions are useful for long tasks, like navigation or high-level robot behaviors. We'll dive into the details of each of these types of connections in later videos, along with the code needed to use them. Now let's look at the information traveling across these connections. It's grouped into packets we call messages. The first important thing about messages is that they are structured. This means that every message has a type that explains the layout of its data. Message types are made of fields that each have a name and a data type. Fields are a lot like variables in a programming language. All the common data types are available, including different sizes of integers, floating point numbers, strings, and arrays. A field's type can even be another message type, so you can nest messages within each other and reuse common structures. The second important thing about messages is that each connection has a specific message type associated with it. Topics have one associated message type, and all of the messages sent across a topic have to be of the same message type. Services and actions have multiple message types, one for the request, one for the result, and so on. There's exactly one type of message used for each part of the communication. It's important that both ends of a connection agree about what message types that connection will use. 
If you try to connect two nodes on the same topic when they're expecting different message types, you'll see errors. The last thing for us to cover in this video is how ROS graph resources are named. The names of elements in the ROS graph act as their unique identifiers. ROS names are structured a bit like file paths, with multiple parts separated by slashes. Each part of the name defines a namespace for grouping resources. For example, if we made a node with the name camera1, it would show up in our ROS graph as a top-level namespace, slash camera1. We could then group topics within that node's namespace, like camera1 images. This makes sure that if another camera node comes along, let's call it camera2, both nodes can have their own images topics. The node's namespaces prevent the topic names from interfering with each other. Camera1 images stays separate from camera2 images. Namespaces can be as deep as you want, and nodes don't have to be at the top. In fact, the node name doesn't have to be part of the topic's name. Imagine a project where I'm running multiple robots, and each has multiple cameras. If I want the images stream from the color camera on the front of the robot named Frank, I might end up with the topic name slash Frank slash camera slash front slash color slash images. The node that's actually advertising that topic might be named slash Frank slash camera slash front slash driver. Hopefully this demonstrates the power of grouping our resources with namespaces. Namespaces can be defined and remapped at runtime, so we won't know the complete name of every resource when we write our code. One of the ways to deal with this is to use the special private namespace character. When we're using the ROS API in our code, we can give it a name that starts with the tilde character. This will get replaced with whatever the node's current namespace actually is at runtime. So we don't have to rewrite our code to change a node's name. And that's all for this video. We've started learning what ROS is, where we can find ROS help online, the anatomy of the ROS graph, and the power of namespaces. I'll see you in the next one.